Good morning, my name is Nicole Fabien. I'm a biologist specialized in autoimmune disease and I'm working in the immunological department in Hospice Civil of Lyon. So, first of all, I will speak today on the strategy and diagnosis of autoantibodies, but as this is a huge domain, I will just focus my talk on the major disease studied by the FAIR network, such as uh, systemic lupus, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, systemic scleroderma, myositis, and vasculitis. So, uh, in our strategy in the lab, we choose to screen uh, by indirect immunofluorescence technique two uh, types of uh, antibodies for systemic disease antinuclear antibodies and uh, for vasculitis uh, onca. And then uh, after the screening, we have to identify the target antigen uh, using different techniques uh, to improve uh, the diagnosis and prognosis of uh, autoimmune disease. So uh, I will give you some pitfalls of the techniques, uh, whatever the presence of autoantibodies and sometimes the absence of them. And uh, I will just want to reinforce also the uh, discussion between clinician and biologist uh, to improve uh, the interpretation of uh, the autoantibodies. So first of all, antinuclear antibodies. This is a really good test because uh, it demonstrates a great performance as a negative test, in fact, is very rare in systemic diseases, especially uh, in uh, systemic lupus. So uh, we see that uh, there is a, a poor specificity because uh, you've got ANA in some other diseases or uh, like uh, viral or bacterial infections, drugs, and uh, LC people older than uh, 60 years. But this specificity is better when you identify the target antigens, whatever in the nuclear antigens. Here you can see that by indirect immunofluorescence, we can have some speckle pattern, homogeneous pattern, nucleolar pattern, and cytoplasmic ones. And we can decide, in fact, to identify some antigens when you have this special pattern. We use some uh, technique other than indirect immunofluorescence, ELISA, DOT, but here you are uh, aware and cautious uh, of the technique used because the antigens used in technique uh, have been purified or recombinant or sometimes conjugates are different and can give false positive and sometimes false negative uh, uh, reaction. First of all, for the systemic lupus, you know all that uh, ANA uh, are belong to the immunological criteria for this uh, disease, and it is very important. Uh, there are many, many autoantibodies described in systemic lupus, but I will focus on the interesting antibodies such as anti-SM antibodies, uh, which the prevalence is not so high, only 10%, but the specificity is really high, about 95%. Then you've got the anti-SSA antibody, but only the 60 KDA, and uh, which are present in different uh, phenotype of uh, lupus, but also uh, in Jugutrojogren syndrome. There are two pitfalls. With some ep 2 cells, you know, we have some false negative. So when you ask for anti-SSA, be sure that the laboratory uh, make an identification technique because you can have false negative. And the second pitfall is that uh, sometimes when the lab use a mixture of uh, anti-SSA 60 KDA and anti-52 KDA, uh, it could be uh, uh, a result of positive anti-SSA, but only 52. 
So be aware that there are no interests for antibodies against 52 KDA. For anti-U1 RNP, 60 KDA, they are very important with a prevalence of 30%, but uh, uh, they are also present in Sharp syndrome. One uh, antibody which is uh, also very interesting is the uh, anti kiau antibodies uh, uh, with a prevalence of 5 to 10 persons and uh, present also in myositis. But it could be interesting in lupus with no uh, particular other antibodies. Two uh, pitfalls in this diagnosis is uh, anti-PCNA antibody. We thought that there is that they are very important with a good specificity, and uh, but we made a, a study, a multi-center study, which demonstrated that uh, anti-PCNA antibodies could be detected in other diseases than lupus. So you have to not interpret them as a, a specific marker for this uh, systemic lupus. And uh, uh, the other uh, also pitfalls here is uh, the presence of uh, anti-dense fine speckle lens epithelium derived growth factor, uh, anti-DFS 70 uh, key the uh, antibodies because they can mask anti-DSDNA or anti-SS antibodies and of course, uh, they have been discovered and detected in healthy people, but uh, you should be aware that uh, they can mask anti-DSDNA and uh, anti-SSA or antibodies which can be useful in systemic lupus. For anti-DSDNA antibodies, very specific normally for lupus, but once again, be careful of the technique that be used to detect them because you see here uh, we thought that the pharisa is the best technique but nowadays it's quite difficult to perform them in routine lab and so we have to use ELISA or other immunoassay that could be um, um, can give a poor performance uh, in uh, terms of specificity you see that some ELISA give uh, 12 uh, 19 percent of specificity that's that's not very good you know uh, you can have also false positive but normally uh, always IgM in uh, gushu chagrin syndrome autoimmune hepatitis and uh, with some uh, uh, drugs anti TNF alpha and uh, at last the absent do not exclude the SLE diagnosis of course uh, when I, I talk about uh, the value of uh, identify ANA, uh, that's a, a cartoon slide where we can see that uh, in some infection, cancer or drugs, you can have a very high amount of uh, ANA, of positive ANA, even in, even in blood donor and healthy people. Uh, patients uh, over than 60 uh, years, you see 20 uh, Twenty percent of the patient could be positive, and uh, what I recommend is a higher deletion uh, of the screening of the ANA because you see that uh, only five percent can be positive against uh, thirteen percent uh, using uh, a low deletion at uh, eight point eighty. So um, you know that there are a lot, a lot of uh, different autoantibodies described in uh, systemic lupus, more than uh, 150. But among this uh, huge amount of autoantibodies, some are, are really interesting also, like uh, antinucleosome antibodies present in uh, a lupus uh, without DSDNA. That uh, so you, you can ask for them if you do not do not have uh, any uh, positive marker for lupus. The second one is uh, anti-ribosomal P proteins uh, autoantibodies, uh, which give a, a really uh, typical pattern on, uh, cytoplasm, on the cytoplasm of uh, HEP2 cells, and they are very, very specific of lupus. The third one is uh, anti-C1Q antibodies uh, with uh, a really interest in the activity and renal flare both in uh, uh, pediatric and uh, adult uh, patients.
uh, for the other one, anti-histone antibody, uh, forget them because they are no more interesting. They are uh, they give a poor specificity, and so don't ask uh, any more for those uh, antibodies. Uh, one antibody that could be interesting is that uh, anti-interferon uh, alpha-2 antibodies, as uh, we can uh, detect them nowadays with a commercial kit, and uh, we try to uh, understand what, the, what is the role of these antibodies in autoimmune disease and also their prevalence. For the antiphospholipid uh, autoantibodies uh, syndrome, uh, that is uh, our frequent marker in systemic lupus, you can have uh, two types of markers, one uh, conventional markers, uh, and you should ask for three of them, lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipid, IgG and IgM, and antibeta 2 glycoprotein 1 um, and you have to ask for uh, two tests uh, uh, within 12 weeks of interval and with high titers because you know you can have uh, uh, often low titers and uh, in infection disease, in viral infection notably. So you have to uh, be sure that in 12 weeks of interval you keep these high titers uh, to be sure that it is a good uh, mark of uh, antiphospholipid uh, syndrome or uh, in systemic lupus. We've got also non-conventional markers of, such as type IgA and also antiphosphatidyl antenolamine, antiprotrombin, uh, which are very interesting in some case of caps with no conventional markers. For the other disease uh, which interests the FAIR network is uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, uh, ALNA are often asked uh, in first intention, even if there is no really diagnosis utility because uh, they are not very specific, but their presence is really associated with an increased risk of uh, uveitis. Uh, in this disease, uh, you can also detect uh, a rheumatoid factor, even if they are rare. Their presence also is associated with a severe prognosis. And uh, you can also uh, detect anticyclic citrullinated peptides. Another disease is the uh, Goujereau syndrome, goujereau jograin syndrome, uh, with the presence of anti-SSA of uh, 60 KD8, present to uh, 60 to 70 percent of patients. But sometimes uh, they are not present and uh, you can detect ANA, but uh, with no specificity. And uh, sometimes also rheumatoid factor, and sometimes no uh, autoantibodies at all. There is also a great interest to detect uh, autoantibodies uh, uh, in these uh, systemic sclerosis because uh, you see that uh, nowadays the presence of one of these autoantibodies such as anti-centromere, anti-topoisomerase 1 or anti-RNA polymerase 3 give three points in the score and you know that you have a, a, a total score uh, up to nine to be classified as having a definite systemic sclerosis. So which autoantibodies to be chosen to this systemic sclerosis? Besides the antibodies with a physiopathological role, such as anti-endothelial cells, anti-fibroblasts, and anti-PGDGF receptor, we uh, show here that you have a huge amount of uh, other antibodies which could be very useful in the diagnosis and prognosis of this disease. You see here that uh, three antibodies, uh, such as anti-centromere, anti-THTO, anti-PMSL, are associated with quite good prognosis in this disease. But when you have the presence of anti-SL70, antifibrillarine, and anti-RNA polymerase 3, it is really associated with a poor prognosis, a severe prognosis. So for anti-centromere antibodies, uh, which are present in limited systemic sclerosis, up to 40%, uh, 
you should have uh, the typical pattern to interpret uh, the positivity of these antibodies. For anti-THTO, they are not really prevalent, but could be interesting uh, because they can be a predictive value for uh, a scleroderma. And uh, once again, be careful because some dots give uh, a false negative uh, ET uh, of these uh, uh, autoantibodies. For anti-PMSL antibodies, they are present in patients with both disease, scleroderma and uh, myositis, with a moderate severity, and they give uh, uh, a typical pattern on speckled and uh, nucleolar pattern, which is very characteristic of those uh, autoantibodies. We uh, speak uh, now of uh, antibodies uh, which are uh, more associated with severe prognosis, such as antitopoisomerase 1 antibodies, present more in diffuse uh, sclerosis, with a prevalence of uh, 50% uh, in adults and 34% in children. And uh, once again, like anticentromere antibodies, you should have a, a typical IIF pattern because some identification technique give false positive, but really uh, with uh, sometimes low level. Antifibrillarine are antibodies uh, against uh, with uh, a poor prognosis, with uh, renal crisis, calcinosis, and uh, myositis. And uh, they are quite typical by RF. So uh, you should uh, uh, ask the biologist uh, when uh, uh, you have this typical pattern to identify them as antifibrillarine antibody with some dot. For anti RNA polymerase 3, uh, again, poor prognosis with renal crisis and cancer also. You see that in our court we found that 27% of patients with these antibodies uh, display a cancer. So uh, be aware and ask uh, for uh, searching a cancer when you've got these uh, antibodies positive. For the uh, big group of uh, myositis, uh, it's really interesting to see uh, how uh, 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 numerous antibodies, new antibodies have been discovered and could be very interesting in diagnosis and uh, also in prognosis because anti-MDR5 are associated with uh, uh, extremely severe pulmonary manifestation anti-NXP2 and anti-TIF1 gamma with cancer, so it's, they are very, very interesting in clinical practice. For immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, you've got two antibodies, anti-SRP and anti-HMG-CR. Uh, and for myositis of the syndromes, I will just uh, discuss on the anti syndrome. And the last one, uh, for the inclusion body myositis, you've got the anti-CN1 uh, antibody. For the anti-amino acyl RNT synthetase, uh, we demonstrate that 11 uh, can be detected, but uh, uh, the major one are anti-G1, anti-PL12, and PL7, as the other uh, give uh, a poor uh, sensitivity because of the techniques. We don't have a really uh, performant technique to detect them. For anti-G1, just uh, to know that we can have false negative using uh, RF, so you have to ask them, namely, when you have a suspicion of myositis. For anti-PL7 or anti-PL12, we don't have any much problem because they, have, uh, they give a, a typical pattern in, uh, on EP2 cells, uh, a very nice cytoplasmic pattern. And it could be useful, these antibodies, also in some uh, ILD with no my my myositis at all at the time we discover this antibody, but what on the predictive value, it could be very interesting. For anti-MDR5, uh, which are present in uh, clinical amniotic dermatomyositis, we know that uh, it's 
extremely important to detect them because they are often associated with a rapid, progressive and severe intestinal uh, lung disease with uh, um, ischemic ulcer, very typical, and sometimes with uh, variable infection also. Uh, we've got some pitfalls like uh, other antibodies because we have got some false negative with some dot. For antitive and gamma, which uh, are also uh, very, very important because they are associated with cancer, and you see here that in our court from Lyon, 88% of patients uh, with these uh, antibodies uh, have a cancer associated or develop a cancer within two years uh, before the discovery of these uh, antibodies. Again, uh, anti-NXP2, uh, P2, uh, interesting in juvenile dermatomosaitis and adult dermatomosaitis with, again, an association with uh, cancer. For immune uh, mediated necrotizing myopathy, anti-HMG coenzyme uh, reductase are very important and uh, they are very good technique. Whatever you use uh, for uh, this antibody, we are lucky because uh, the prevalence is up to 25% and the specificity is very, really, really high, uh, about 99%. And again, uh, they are associated with uh, carcinoma. For anti-SRP uh, antibodies, uh, it's not the same because uh, you should have a typical pattern on uh, uh, HEP2 cells to uh, really uh, show that the antibodies are positive because some dots give uh, a false positive. Sometimes they are low level, but sometimes high, high level. Anyway, you should have the both uh, typical pattern and identification with some dot. The last one is uh, anti-CN1A autoantibodies in patients with uh, uh, this disease. Uh, with a clinical, uh, typical uh, clinical feature with slow progressive muscle weakness. And uh, we've got uh, quite a high sensitivity in our court of uh, more than 70% and with a really good specificity of 88% compared with some uh, dermatomyositis. And at last, uh, I will speak on the ANCA, because you know that uh, ANCA nowadays are associated uh, with uh, ANCA-associated vasculitis. And like ANA, we perform a screening using RF, and when the positive uh, RF uh, uh, is here, we have to identify them uh, with uh, anti myeloperoxidase uh, kit or anti proteinase 3 kit. And thus, uh, they are really important. Once again, we've got some pitfalls because they are false positive, certainly due uh, to the major presence of uh, ANA. And uh, you should also be aware that the presence of anti pr 3 or MPO are present in non vasculitis disease such as ulcerative colitis or viral infection. And uh, last, uh, we can have some false negative, uh, uh, around 1 to 5%, uh, uh, that could be anti-MPO or PS3 positive. So when you have a real suspicion of vasculitis, please ask both uh, antibodies uh, with IF. So thank you for your attention. And there is my uh, mail address uh, if you are to uh, uh, add me some uh, more questions on these uh, out antibodies and techniques and whatever you like. Thank you.